Okay, let's get started. So today I thought I would uh, sort of finish up what we were doing yesterday um, by showing you existential types. Because if you've seen universal types, you have to see existential types as well. Uh, and then, um, you know, so far, this is a logical relation for system F that's up on the board, which is a terminating language. So the other thing that I'd like to do is to show you how to extend it uh, for a non-terminating language. So we'll throw recursive types back in after we deal with existential stuff, all right? Okay, just to sort of show you what the main changes are that you would make to something like this in order to handle uh, recursive types. Okay, so um, existentials. So first of all, why do we want existential <laughs> types? So for instance, in a language like Java, when you write, you know, here's an interface uh, for something, and then you go off and implement it, right? Um, that's essentially, you know, you use that sort of technique in order to implement abstract data types. You know, I've been giving you this example of a stack. For a stack, you might declare an interface. You would say, okay, I have uh, an interface that gives me three methods. You know, I can create a new stack. I can uh, push onto the stack and pop from the stack, all right? So your interface would define the signature for that, and then you would go off and write an implementation. Um, there is a famous paper by John Mitchell from 1986 with this title, Abstract Data Types Have Existential Types. Pretty much the title says it all, all right? <laughs> okay, so that really is what I, I want to talk about now. Uh, all right, so what do we mean abstract data types and existential types? Uh, well, so roughly speaking, if I wanted to write an interface for a stack, I might say my stack type is something like uh, there exists an alpha, and the alpha stands for the type that I'm going to use for my concrete implementation of the, sta of the stack. But I'm not going to tell you what it is because this is my interface. All right, so I'm going to say there exists an alpha, and I'm going to not do this in like absolute formal notation. This is supposed to be suggestive. And I'm going to give you um, sort of a record, an object, whatever, so to speak, um, with three fields. So I can make a stack, all right? So when I make a stack, I will give you back an alpha. Uh, I can uh, push onto a stack. So let's say um, I take a stack, I take an integer I want to push onto the stack, and I give you back a new stack. All right, so that's my push method, the signature for it, rather. And I have pop. Pop says, if you give me a stack, I will give you back an integer and a modified stack, because now you know, it's had one element popped off of it. So that doesn't look like Java or whatever other language, but you know, that is an interface. It's hiding something from you. It is hiding all the alphas from you. The alpha stands for the stack type. It is the thing that the client cannot see. The client cannot see whether you um, chose to implement the stack as an array or as a linked list, for example. All right? Um, OK, so that is essentially you know, what an existential type looks like. More generally, just like we had for all alpha tau, we're going to write exists alpha tau. And this tau part was what you know, that record was supposed to suggest, or tuple, if you will. Um, of course, I put the tags in here just to be suggestive. I won't do that now. Uh, all right, so for existential types, so here's my interface, right? That's just the type. Now I need to implement it. So how do I write something that has existential types? Well, so if you were to implement a stack, you would create a package, okay? You would literally use pack to, um, Let's say you were implementing it as a list. You might say, OK, my pack is going to contain two things. First, it's going to contain the type that I want alpha to have for this particular implementation. So if I want to implement my stack as an array, I would say something like, all right, I'm going to use an array of And again, so far, I'm being just sort of suggestive. I'm not being very formal. I know I don't have an array type up there or anything. OK, so I would package up um, the type that I want to use for my concrete implementation with an implementation that makes use of arrays. All right, so now I would give you, I would actually implement three methods um, for make and push and pop. Uh, this would take, oh, make should actually be 
unit arrow alpha. Okay? So, I won't show you those. All right, three functions that implement those, but implement those using an array this time. Right, that's the, that's the general idea. Um, so pack is how we create something of existential type. It's the introduction form. And the elimination form will be an unpack. All right? Okay, so how many people have seen pack unpack existential types just, just in terms of syntax before? Okay, gives me a sense. Um, all right, so let's see. Let's um, maybe take a look at... Um, I'm going to do two things. Um, all right, let's start with the example. I don't want to talk about stacks. Let, let me give you a more um, simple sort of example. Suppose that tau um, is the type exists alpha, alpha cross alpha arrow bool. OK? And I'm going to give you two expressions, E1. Um, so I want to give you two expressions of this type. So first, let's create a package where we choose to implement the alpha using an int. By the way, the type that you put in the package is called your witness type. It is the thing that, is, you know, that alpha stands for in this package. Um, and then I have to create a pair, right? So for my pair, I'm going to put I have to put an integer here, and I have to put a function from int to bool, right? Two things. Those are the two components of my pair. So let's say I put in uh, 1, and the function that says lambda x int uh, is x equal to 0. There's a package. OK? Now I should show you typing rules, and we should actually check that that uh, type checks. Um, actually, let me write down both expressions that I have in mind first. Uh, let's create another package that implements, that has the same existential type, but this time my implementation, my package, will use a Boolean as a witness type. Okay, so I have bool and I need a pair here with a Boolean uh, paired with a function from bool to bool. And I can just do, let's do not x. OK? So e1 um, uses integers inside to represent the alphas. And it's just a pair of the number 1 and a function that tests if x is 0. Right? OK? And this one uh, uses Booleans. It pairs up uh, true with lambda x, not x. All right, let's write down the typing rule, and then we'll kind of go back to, to those two implementations. Um, where I'm going with this is that I claim that those two implementations are equivalent. All right? Yes? How are they related to tau? They both have type tau. Hmm? How do you see that? So let's write down the typing rule so we can see that. Okay. Uh, so in general, the typing rule for pack looks uh, like this. Yeah, it's not exactly the definition of interface, but you can translate a Java interface to that. Let's, uh, I can show you that offline. Okay? All right. Um, this was meant to be suggestive that, uh, you know, you can write an interface like that. Uh, okay, so wait. Um, coming back to pack. So if we have pack, the form of a pack expression is pack, a type with an expression um, as exists alpha tau. Right? And I'll tell you why I'm saying as exists alpha tau in the, in the syntax itself in just a second. Okay? So, um, well, basically I'm saying pack tau e as exists alpha tau is the introduction form that we're adding to our expression. All right. Yes. Oh, yes. Let's do a different tau. That would be good. 
<laughs> we don't want to make those two tau's the same. The tau prime is what I'm using for my witness. All right, that's tau prime is going to stand for the alpha in here. All right, so when is that the case? When E, this E, has the type tau with this witness type tau prime substituted for alpha. Oh, and we should also make sure that tau prime is well formed in our current environment delta. Okay? So what is this saying? It's just saying I am providing some implementation. That implementation itself needs to type check knowing what the alpha is, so to speak, right? With the witness type actually plugged in for the alpha. All right? Um, and then we have an unpack rule. What unpack does is it sort of takes the pack apart. The pack has two components. It has a witness type, and it has the expression that implements that um, existential type, right? So unpack is going to pull out the tau and the expression. So we're going to write something like, um, unpack alpha x equals E1 in E2. What that says is if E1 is a pack with a tau prime and an E, then bind uh, tau prime to alpha, sorry, alpha to tau prime, and x to that expression. All right? So we're just extracting the two components of that package, calling them alpha and x respectively, and then we get to use alpha and x in the body of the unpack to do whatever we want with those components. That's how we take a pack apart and then work with it. Yes? Maybe this is sort of like the answer to question that included in the existential instruction rule. Are you missing that the type change notion is that sort of the Yes, thank you. <laughs> yep, I need to say colony. <laughs> yes. Because as I said, this is part of syntax. All right, so let's actually come back to that. I forgot to come back to that. Um, why do we write as exists alpha tau in the syntax? Yes? You don't know which thing to substitute. Where right. We have no idea. If, we, if you don't tell me what interface you're trying to implement, so to speak, then I have no idea where to substitute. Right? What, what type do you want me to come up with at the end? What am I going to substitute um, that tau prime? into, so to speak, right? OK, so that's very important. That I have to tell you what, what interface I'm trying to produce a valid implementation of. All right, so um, unpack. All right, unpack is interesting. So basically, the E1 has to be of existential type, because it's the thing that we're trying to eliminate. So we need to make sure that E1 has type exists alpha tau. OK, start there. Uh, now, I already said that you extract the components of a package, and you bind them to these you know, alpha and x, the type variable and a term variable, and then you can use these in the body of the unpack. The E2 is called the body of the unpack. So you can use alpha and x in the body of the unpack. What that means is that when you go, when we go and type check E, we get to extend our delta and gamma environments with these two um, variables. Yes, okay. So an unpack is, has a let kind of form, right? Let x equal v1 and e2. It's exactly that kind of form, except that an unpack is taking apart a package and extracting the two components and then using those names in the body to do something with it. All right, so um, there's one other condition that we need. Oh, and by the way, yes, so if e2 type checks with type tau2 under this extended environment, then the entire unpack has type tau2 because that's the thing that it returns. There's another very important condition. That tau2 should not have alpha free in it. I'm going to write that simply as tau2 is well formed in delta. Notice that I have a comma here. So I'm assuming that this alpha does not appear in delta. That's what this is saying. This is saying that tau2 must not contain alpha free in it. And that's really important. Okay. Why is it important? If I could take, the whole point is that we're trying to hide the, the witness type inside a package, all right? With an unpack, you get to pull it out temporarily, so to speak, within a certain scope, within the scope of, the, of this body of the unpack. And you get to 
know that, uh, well, I mean, you basically pull out the components. You refer to them as alpha and, you know, some sort of variable x. And you manipulate them in some way. Um, I'll show you an example in a second. Um, but then when you're done, if you returned an alpha, then, you know, you've exposed to the outer world what that alpha was. So if it would sort of, it would defeat the whole point of hiding the types. That's how I, you know, you should think about this. All right, so coming back to these two packages, these I basically claim I am trying to write down two implementations. This tau is this e existential type up here. And I claim that both of these packages have this type tau. So now that the pack rule is up there, we can actually, you know, go ahead and check that, that that's the case. So let's do one of them. Uh, we're type checking them, they're closed expressions, we're type checking them in an empty environment. So if we take pack int one paired with lambda x int x equals zero, and we're trying to type check it as that existential type up there. Okay, what happens? What does our pack rule tell us? It says, go ahead and type check the implementation, but you can now use this tau prime for alpha. All right, what that means is that over here, in the empty environment, we need to type check this part, the pair, right? Because this is just the witness type. We ignore that for a second. Um, we need to make sure that this pair of 1 and lambda x and x equals 0 has the type. What type should it have? Here's my, if you ignore the exist alpha, here's my tau. Into that tau, I'm going to substitute the witness type. What does that give me? Put in int for alphas, right? OK, so that gives me int cross int arrow blue. My pack rule is telling me to make sure that that pair has that type, right? Because it's telling me to take the original type tau from under here, substitute the witness type in for alpha, and then go and type check. All right, so does this pair have this pair type? One is an int, good. The function takes an int, good, and produces a Boolean. So this is perfectly well typed, right? Yes? OK, good. Uh, we can do our other one as well, right? Let's just change this. Um, E2 has a Boolean here, it has true here, uh, and the function lambda x bool not x there. All right, this time I'll have to make sure that true paired with lambda x bool not x has the type. I'm sticking in bools for alphas. So bool cross bool arrow bool. True is a Boolean, so good. The first component of the pair is fine. The second is bool to bool, which is exactly what we want. So they're both packages of exactly the same existential type. Inside, they have Booleans versus integers. But that's OK. The alpha is hiding that. Right? They are both of exactly the same type. And now here's the other really, sorry, I'll take a question, yeah. Uh, I was trying to figure out, you, you meant this before, but why do you need to explicitly say as type tau at the end? OK. Um, is it for type checking? I don't know where the alphas are so to speak, right? Uh, yes, it is for type checking. OK, so suppose I gave you this expression, okay. and I didn't say as what type. I don't know what type I am trying to assign to this, right? Like, what, uh, how am I trying to oh, check so it? So you wouldn't know where in that expression the rules would be plugged in? Exactly. Okay. okay? If I don't know where the alphas are, I don't know where to plug in um, the witness type. OK? okay? All right. Um, OK, so we've seen both, of, both E1 and E2 have exactly the same existential type. They are also equivalent. Let's see why. So how can you use a pack? Yes? Uh, OK, so well, first you unpack it. And then within the body of the unpack, you take the first thing and pass it to the second thing. Now let's see um, why, why he said that. Sorry, what's your name? Alex. Alex? Let's see why he said that. All right, let's not use y here. We'll use um, p. 
P for pair. Okay, so I'm going to unpack E1 and then do something with it. All right, so when I unpack this package E1, let's see, what can I do with it? Well, I get, uh, I get the witness type, it's an int, fine, uh, but I get this pair, one and that. Now let's, let's see, um, basically whatever the body of the unpack is, whatever I write over here, just keep in mind that it, the body of the unpack needs to type check in an environment that has an alpha and an x. In that case, it'll be alpha and p. But it promises to treat these alpha, the, the alpha it has to promise to treat opaquely, abstractly. It's just going to pass alpha blobs around. All right? It can't look at them. It can't test them because they're alphas. All right? So um, let me see. I'm going to write some code, and you tell me if it type checks. Uh, suppose that I take my pair, and I take the second component of the pair, and I apply it to 5. No? Why not? But wait, wait, wait. Second of p is this function. It takes an int. Why can't I pass it 5? The, the, type, is hidden. Hmm? the type is hidden. The type is hidden. OK. So what that means, what, what, what you're saying is that this, the body of my unpack, we need to type check that in an environment, well, my delta gamma were empty to begin with, but in an environment where I have alpha in my delta environment, and I have p colon what type? Alpha cross alpha to bool, not int cross int to bool. Okay, where int is my witness type. That's the key thing. Alpha cross alpha to bool. In that environment, I have to type check the body of the unpack, which is this expression. Sorry very little space for a turnstile here. Um, but this is the environment in which I'm trying to type check this expression. All right, if I take the second of this pair, I get an alpha arrow bool. An alpha arrow bool wants an alpha as an input. It can't take an int, an arbitrary int as an input. So what can I pass to this function? Where do I get an alpha? First of p, exactly. That's what he said. The only thing you can do with this package is unpack it, has two pieces in it, has an alpha, and it has an alpha or a bool function. The only thing you can ever apply that function to is to the alpha that's sitting right there in that package. If you didn't have an alpha sitting there in that package, you wouldn't be able to pass it to the function, right? I mean, you wouldn't be able to use the function in any way whatsoever. All right. Um, now. OK, so that's the only thing you can ever do. Hmm. So what does that mean? Of course, this applies to the second e expression, E2, as well, right? We're going to have the same constraints. We're going to have to type check any body of you know, the unpack that we write for E2 here um, under the same constraint. We're going to have to treat the pair as an alpha cross alpha or a bool. And then again, we can only apply second of p to first of p, and that's it. OK, so that means, now let's Let's see why I claim that these two packages are equivalent. At the type alpha, the only alpha we have in this world is 1. The only value of type alpha we have in this world is this 1. The only value we have of type alpha in this world is true. Remember how we were setting up relations, basically? Think of that as our relation is that 1 is related to true. This is an alpha value sitting inside E1, and this is an alpha value sitting inside E2. All right? OK. Um, now, how do we use the unpack? All right, we have to pass 1 to this function. Is 1 equal to 0? No. So you're always going to get back false, right? When you unpack this package and you apply second of p to first of p, you are always going to get back false. Because there's no other alpha. The only alpha you can ever feed in is this one right here. And when you apply this function to one, you get back false. Here, when the only input you can ever feed into this function is the alpha value that's sitting right here. So you will have to apply this function to true, and not true is false. That function will also always give you back false. You just can't ever get back anything else, because you can't feed in another, uh, a different value. 
these two packages are equivalent. You can't use them in any way and discover the difference between them, as long as you, you know, write well-typed code over here in the body of your unpack. OK? Cool? <laughs> yes? Uh, what would happen if that tau was actually alpha cross alpha c alpha, and you tried to apply it to the expression at the bottom? OK, say that again. Uh, the tau was alpha cross? Um, first of all, these won't, aren't currently, they're not well typed, right? Yeah? Okay. But still, we can try to see. If we were unpacking some arbitrary expression E that had a type like that, exists alpha, alpha, cross alpha, or alpha, um, what would we be able to, to do here? Well, we'd have to take second of P, Right? And apply it to first of P. Again, that's the only thing that type checks. But now the problem is, so this is the body of my unpack, right? This is the expression E2 that's sitting right here in the unpack rule. Can I, can I simply write this expression, type check it, and be done with it? No. What, what rule am I violating in my typing rule? Or what? The last one. This entire E2 returns an alpha right now. So it takes in the right inputs and everything's fine, but it's trying to return an alpha. And you cannot return an alpha from the body of an unpack, as dictated by this. So that won't type check. You won't be allowed to write that. What you can write is something like this. Um, OK, let, uh, this is going to be a useless expression, but let uh, z equal that in 0 or true, or false, or whatever you like. Identity function. You can return some constant. That's perfectly fine. Yes? So does this mean that the only instructions that they can use are the ones that provide some options to translate the abstracted type to some concrete, well, to some already known type? Yes, so the idea is, like, if you just go back to the idea of a stack, what are we doing here? We're saying, all right, I'm going to create a stack for you, and now an alpha a stack has come into existence, and you have it once you use the make. And now you can take that stack, you can feed it to the push and pop methods, and you can do various things with, with you know, um, the in, maybe the integers that you're pushing and popping. Uh, you can use your stack, but when you're done using your stack, you cannot return the contents um, or you know, the, the stack type or the stack itself for the world to see you know, how exactly is the stack implemented. You can use it, but then you close things up, you, you take the other, you know, the, the, the side effect, the, the actual answer that you wanted in using the stack, and return that to the world. So is it possible to create, to write a non-preservation function that would uh, work for any uh, non-type type or any stack? Like, let's say I want to push three integer values and then just return it to another part of the code to use it. This would be impossible to write. You want to push three integer values and... So you want to just create this uh, stack yeah. and give it to some other part of the world. You would have to do it within sort of the nested unpack. And this is the formalization of it, right? Um, this is what um, practical surface languages, they don't have to force you to do this kind of scoping trick, but this is formally what it should translate down to. Right? And, and when we translate a surface language into a core calculus, there we're trying to make the point that this kind of scoping is, is critical. Right? You can do that form formally in this setting in configuration passage files. So your function takes a, another function that just calls in the result. The result type the form doesn't think so it makes sense. Ah, thank you. Okay. Um, all right. I haven't shown you what the operational semantics of the um, pack and pack are. I've just sort of said it um, verbally. Um, so when we do unpack alpha x, uh, I should extend. So here I should extend my syntax with unpack alpha x equals e1 in e2. Uh, my value forms, I will have to add pack tau v as 
exists alpha tau as a value form. Sorry, I'm getting a bit scrunched. Um, when I evaluate, I have to evaluate the expression in a pack down to a value. So I will have an evaluation context that looks like pack tau e, as exists alpha tau. And when I try to deal with unpack, I first want to evaluate the e1. Okay. Once we have reduced the package down to an actual pack value, we will go ahead and unpack it. So the reduction rule for that looks like you unpack a pack tau v, and I'll skip the exists alpha tau part, um, in some e2 by simply substituting tau for alpha and v for x in e2. So we step to e2 with tau for alpha and v for x. Okay? All right. So now what we'd like is to take the logical relation that's up on the board still from yesterday and uh, extend, you know, add a value interpretation for existential types. As soon as we do that, we'll have a logical relation that can serve as a proof method for actually carrying out the proof that E1 is equivalent to E2. I mean, right now I just sort of hand waved and tried to explain it to you, right? I claim that, well, the only alpha you can pass in is the one that you have sitting in the first component of the pair. But how does that actually work as a general proof technique? How do you turn a crank on a proof method and prove that these two packages are equivalent? Our logical relation should give us the method to do that. OK, so um, any questions about any of this before we edit the logical relation? No? OK. All right. Uh, Up, yes, thanks. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm going to move this up here. V alpha equal rho. Okay, so the value interpretation of exists alpha tau. When are two values related or equivalent at the type exists alpha tau? What are the value forms for existential? Packs. Pack tau 1 v1. I'll skip the exists alpha. Oh, okay, I'll write it. <laughs> As exists. Technically, it would be row 1 applied to exists alpha tau. And the other value would be pack tau 2 v2. As row 2 exists alpha tau. So I have two packs. They have two different witness types. That matches the example that we have up there. Two packs, two different witness types. They can have the same witness type too, by the way. You can write down two different pack implementations <coughs> that use the same witness type but have very different code on the inside. They have different invariants. We'll look at another example of that in a, in a few minutes. Okay, so I want to, to be able to say when these two packs are equivalent. So whenever we set up these value interpretations, what do we do? How do we determine whether two values are related at that type? We think about the elimination form, right? We think about how do we use these values? Because we want to make sure that when we use these values, when we eliminate them, um, we get you know, sort of related answers. All right, so how do we use packs? By unpacking, OK. So we might want to write something here which says, well, when I unpack alpha x equals you know, this first pack, something should happen, and when I unpack the second one, something else should happen. Yeah? Could I try it out? Okay. Um, tau 1 v1 in, uh, in what? In some kind of e2 or e1?
Does this remind you of anything that we've done in the last couple of lectures? Think back, which type did we consider that has an elimination form that does sort of a lead binding kind of thing, right? That has a body. Here, unpack, you unpack an E1 and then you use it in an E2. What other type have we considered where sums, yes. So with sums, you do a match or a case on the sum type, and then you have a body, right? You, you have different uh, things that you do, depending on whether it's an in left or an in right. OK, and what did we do with sum types? It did seem like a problem, right? Remember I talked about the fact that, well, you don't know that the, the branches of the case may have a result type that has nothing to do with the sum type. The type may be significantly <laughs> larger, for instance. That's the problem I'm worried about. Um, then, you know, so if the sum type is tau 1 pl plus tau 2, the result of the branches of that case may have some type tau that's much larger than tau 1 plus tau 2. In which case, if we try to think about the type of that body of the, you know, the branches of the case, we are going to end up with, an, uh, with a logical relation that's not well founded, right? Okay, so just by analogy, similar sort of thing is happening here. We can't say, okay, um, I have two packs. How do I use them? I use them by unpacking them. And after I unpack them, I have to think about you know, um, unpacking tau 1 v1 and using it in e1 should give me the same answer as unpacking tau 2 v2 and using it in e2. That's kind of what we want, but we can't say it. Because the results of the e1 and e2, the bodies of the unpack, might be types that are significantly larger. All right? I'm just trying to show you that the naive thing doesn't work, that we, you know, we'd, we'd end up with an ill-founded definition. We can't do this. So what, what do you think we? should try instead. V1 and V2. V1 and V2. Let's focus our attention on V1 and V2 that are sitting inside these packages. And by the way, let me give you another hint. Universal types is what we did yesterday. The definition's still up there. You might want to use it <laughs> to think about how we might do existential types. Universal types. For all tau 1, tau 2 are existential types. There exists tau 1, tau 2, r. Yes. <laughs> OK, they're dual. Um, all right. So really, what we want here, you know, for universals, we, we want it for all types that you could possibly plug in. For existentials, you want to say there exists a tau 1 and a tau 2 and a relation between values of type tau 1 and tau 2 that I can use when making sure that the v1 and v2 are related. Now, that tau 1 tau 2 that I said there exists a tau 1 tau 2, they're actually already sitting our, in our packs because we're using this church style syntax you know, where we have types sitting in our syntax. So we can just get them from there. So we don't actually explicitly have to write there exists a tau 1 and tau 2, they're sitting right here. So, but we do need to say that there exists a relation R that relates values of these two witness types, tau 1 and tau 2. Once so we say that there must exist a relation such that V1 is related to V2 their values. So at the value interpretation of what type? These Vs, if you look at the pack rule, they have type tau, right? With their respective witness types. So this V1 has type tau with tau 1 for alpha, and this has type tau with tau 2 for alpha. Actually, you have to close it off with row 1 and row 2 as well. But you get the idea. All right, so we want to say that they're related at the type tau, just like yesterday, right? The two values, actually, this is a tau with tau, prime, tau 1 for alpha, and this is tau with tau 2 for alpha. Just like yesterday, these guys had different types. So what did we do? We stuck the types in the relational substitution because we couldn't put them here. We left the alpha free in there. So we're doing exactly the same sort of thing. We're going to say uh, we have to um, use alpha maps to tau 1, tau 2, and our relation R. OK, so what is it saying? It's saying two packages are related if the implementations that are sitting inside the packages appear to be related at some relation that you get to decide upon. You have to give me that there exists one relation, and I will use that and make sure that under the, you know, whatever assumption of relatedness that you get to stick in here, 
I can show that these two are equivalent. So if we go back to the packages that are over here, how might we prove that they are equivalent? And by the way, that's it. We don't change anything else in our logical relation. We've just added a case for existential types. Everything else remains uh, exactly as it was yesterday. Right? And now we're ready to formally prove that these two packages are equivalent. All right? So how do we do that? So what we want to prove is that E1 is logically related to E2. We're going to use this. Right? We want to show that in empty delta gamma, this E1 is logically related to the E2 at this type tau, which is exists alpha, alpha cross, alpha arrow bool. Right? Sorry, it's very scrunched up. Um, <laughs> exists alpha, alpha cross, alpha arrow bool. OK, what does that mean? Um, it means. Well, if we look at the definition, it says you get to assume a row and a gamma that satisfy the empty environments. There are going to be the empty substitutions. And then we have to show that the two packs are related to each other in the E relation, right? So basically, we have to show that uh, pack int 1, et cetera, is related to pack that. So E1 is related to E2 in E of exists alpha, alpha cross, alpha arrow bool. And in order to show that, we have to basically establish that these two evaluate down to values. But it's convenient that they're already values. All right? So it suffices to show that exactly these two packs that, are, that I have written up there are, belong to the value interpretation of that same type, because we know they're already values. All right. Now, how do we show that these two packs belong to the interpretation of exists alpha tau? Well, let's see what it says. It says that you have to come up with a relation. You have to show me that there exists a relation R between the type int, uh, between values of type int and bool. All right? So this is where we get to pick an R. Pick R equal to something. R is a relation for alpha. What R should we pick? We'll have to pick an R that lets us show the following thing. It lets us show that this pair is related to this pair. That one, um, well, when we, when we show that pairs are related, we really have to show that the components are related, right? That's what this proof is going to go on. So we're going to end up having to show that one is related to true in V of alpha with alpha maps to int bool and our mystery r. And we're going to have to show that the functions are related. So we're going to end up having to show that lambda x int x equals 0 is related to lambda x bool, not x, as are related as functions of type alpha arrow bool. And again, in this exact extended environment. So does that give you a hint? What R do we pick? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't realize. Someone should just ask. <laughs> I have to show that 1 is related to true in V of alpha. What is V of alpha? R. V of alpha is R. I have to show that 1 is related to true in R. Therefore, what is R? OK. <laughs> All right, so if we picked R to be that, and we can do this with guesswork, right? Like so, so, so far, examining the first statement we have to prove, it looks like R should be that relation. But let's make sure that that R is going to work for the second bit that we have to prove, right? We still have to prove that the second thing in that, uh, the second components of those pairs are related, right? Sorry, let me find a good placement for this. Here we go. All right. So now we need to show that the function lambda x, x equals 0 is, is related to the function lambda x, not x. How do we show the two functions are related? Well, the function definition says, give me two things that are related of the argument type. 
So I have to start by saying, suppose that I have two things, v1 and v2, any arguments that are related at the argument type alpha. v alpha, my environment contains alpha maps to int, bool, and our r. So I'm saying, suppose v1, v2 are related at v of alpha. In other words, I'm saying, suppose v1, v2 are in r. Therefore, v1 is one, one and v2 is true. true. OK, so I know this now. And under knowing this, I have to show that the bodies of the lambda, in other words, x equals 0, is related to not x <coughs> at the type bool. Oh yes, I have to substitute, sorry. The x here is v1, and the x here is v2. We know that v1 is 1, and we know that v2 is true. Therefore, both of those are false. And false is related to false and bool, right? So our choice of r forced us. And how did it help us? It basically helped us at this point. At this point, we were forced to say, suppose that I have two arbitrary inputs for my function, completely arbitrary. But they have to be related at the type alpha. So anytime a fun, you know, the function definition kind of says, all right, you have to touch, show two functions are related, you get to, you know, you, you have to start by assuming that you have two arbitrary inputs that are related and then show that your outputs are related. Here what helps us is that, yeah, sure, there are two arbitrary inputs that are related, but they, know, they come from the relation R that we got to pick, so we got to sort of cut down our space to just the one and the truth, and then the rest of the proof goes through, right? So again, it's just the power of parametricity. So this, um, so, we, we use the word parametricity when we're talking about universal types, and we use the word representation independence when we talk about existential types. But it's just a dual concept. It's, it's just a constant, representation independence is a consequence of parametricity. And the phrase means that the representation of the witness type of all of the alphas is something that clients of this existential type will never be able to see. All right? And that's sort of the essence of modularity um, in the software that we build using statically typed good statically typed languages, right? OK. Um, all right. Um, so that's existential types. I think I'm going to do a lot less than I thought. So let me maybe pull. Um, here's what, uh, what is on my list. And maybe I'm going to just get a show of hands to, to assess what I should cover and what I should cut. All right? I want to talk about recursive types. There's something really interesting to show you in terms of how you edit this in order to handle a non-terminating language. In particular, right here, where we say two expressions are related, right now we say that they both run to values and the values are related. You can't do that when you have non-termination, and that's, there's a little subtle thing here with step indexing that I want to show you. That's one thing. Um, then I wanted to briefly talk about how you prove logical relations are sound and complete. But um, all of that is, is in uh, OPLSS lectures from past years, so you can just go and look at it. And the third thing that I wanted to talk about is um, I have a bunch of slides which essentially kind of say a little bit about um, the history of logical relations, mainly touch upon step index logical relations and you know, what work has been done over the last uh, decade or so. They just give you sort of initial pointers to what's out there. Um, and they're sort of from my perspective, obviously. Um, so it's not utterly comprehensive, but it's, uh, there's quite a bit in there. So, but that, there's an emphasis there on application. All right, which ones do you want? <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry, what is that? It's the first one on lectures of previous years. Uh, is what in the lectures of previous years? Or, or the, first one. the third one, yes. Um, I have covered uh, those slides in previous years. I can tell you exactly which previous years. I've added some new stuff now because those were previous years. But <laughs> <laughs> new stuff, OK. Um, but they're mostly, they're, it's just sort of a survey. It's applications, all right? OK, all right. OK, um, let's do that. So. I will tell you how to find the old stuff. Let's start with that, actually. All right, so. OK. Um, if you go look at the, I think OPLSS 12, it's 
So my lectures, OPLS has 12. In fact, one of my undergraduates has taken those lectures and I even put them on YouTube. So you can find them on YouTube if you don't want to stream them from the OPLSS website. Um, but uh, that year I covered, so I, I covered in detail how you do a binary logical relation for recursive types. So how you do LR for recursive types, you know, and this is a binary one for program equivalence. Um, and of course it's step indexed. Um, probably the second last lecture that year also covered mutable references. So I did a type safety proof for mutable references. And um, mutable references are really hard. In particular, when I say mutable references, I'm talking about ML style mutable references um, in the sense that you, you can take um, functions and closures and store them into your memory. Once you can do that, you can create cycles in memory. Once you can create those cycles in memory, um, the semantic model that you try to build for that becomes utterly circular and it needs to be stratified. And the step indexing helps you stratify it. Okay, so all of those, de those details are, are in that lecture. Um, so that was the topic of my PhD thesis. Um, that's also in the slides uh, as a reference. Okay, um, so this is OPLSS lectures. Maybe I should also put down papers. So a lot of the binary logical relations for recursive types, the proofs are spelled out in excruciating detail, <laughs> if you like, um, in the technical report that goes with my ESOP 06 paper. So that was the first paper to show that um, you can actually do sound and complete logical relations for recursive types. Sound and complete with respect to contextual equivalence. Um, there was a tiny subtlety why you know that that wasn't quite established in the original paper on step index logical relations, which is due to Appel and McAllister. And again, you don't have to write down the names of the papers because they're in the slide deck and you can look it up. Okay, um, what else? So, soundness and completeness is also covered in these lectures. Like the technicalities of how you prove that logical relations are sound and complete with respect to contextual equivalence. And that's a really important thing. I, I kind of keep coming back to it because, you know, that's why we build these logical relations. We want a proof method to show that two programs are equivalent, right? And so knowing the details of how, you, once you've set up this logical relation, how do you establish that it is exactly the same thing as what is defined by the, def you know, contextual equivalence? That's, that's critical. That's important to know and do. Um, okay, so, so the OPLSS 12 lectures cover all of that, and I believe the last lecture that year does cover sort of the survey. And um, for all I know, I may have said more than I'll manage to say today. I can't remember. Okay. Um, all right. I think that's it. Was there any other particular point that? No? All right. Yes. But I claim that that's all we need. And you know why that's all we need? It goes back to the definition of contextual equivalence. You know, when we set up the definition of contextual equivalence, we, we wrote down a typed notion of contextual equivalence. So we said, is this darker OK, or should I use a darker one? OK, all right. Um, we said that E1 is contextually equivalent to E2 at some type tau if for all possible well-typed contexts, for all C that take something of type tau that type checks under delta gamma, right, so that we can plug in these E1 and E2, which type check on, under delta gamma, have type tau under delta gamma. So we want a context that has a whole of this type and produces results of that are closed programs of type bool. And then we say that it is in those, you know, in all such well-typed contexts, it better be the case that C with E1 produces the same value as C with E2. So 
So Christopher, coming to your point, you're, you're asking, um, they may, you said something like they may not be equivalent at The tax specification might be wrong? No, right, so, so go back to, we have, we have an alpha, that's the tax, mm -hmm. we have an alpha uh, uh, profit interest rate, alpha interest rate, mm -hmm. yes. and the power is going to alpha the interest of alpha. Yep. Right, the thing alpha should be uh, Boolean, and then the make be true, right? Okay. And then prop always would um, return zero and the same Boolean, mm -hmm. and the push always just return the same Boolean, the Ponzi argument. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so you have two packages, they're doing something that's not very stack-like at all, exactly. but they are equivalent, right. agreed. So in other words, you're trying to point out that what we are talking about, right, we're just, you're absolutely right. We are simply <coughs> talking about when I write down two different packs that implement an existential type, I can use this proof method to show that they are equivalent. And we might be able to do that, but that does not, that is not verification of code. That does not tell us that these two are valid stack implementations. Right? You need to write a much richer specification for a stack implementation and then go take, you know, take a pack implementation and verify it against a rich specification in order to know that it is in fact a stack. Yes? Yes, that's a, that's a, that's a great point. Yeah. Exactly. So if I have false here, then these two packages are not equivalent. Mm -hmm. We will not be able to prove it. Yep. That is, a, uh, that is uh, exactly the, the right idea. In fact, uh, so in the slides, um, I, I briefly talk about um, how we can set up logical relations for uh, concurrency. And then what you can do is you can um, think of the logical relation as instead of E1 equivalent to E2, think of it as an implementation refines a specification. So if you have a concurrent language, you can write down a sequential specification for some concurrent data structure and then show that your you know, very fine-grained concurrent data structure actually implements that specification, refines that specification. And the idea of why I'm writing less than, right? we, we don't want equivalence. In sequential, what we want is that every single behavior of the implementation, and the implementation is concurrent, so it might have many different behaviors, but every single behavior of the implementation should be a possible behavior of the specification. And the specification can be purely naive, simple, sequential code, right? For the same data structure. All right. Um, so this is uh, this is what we did in our Popple 13 paper, and then there's um, follow-up work as well. Uh, okay. So. I have uh, lectures in 2013. I think I mostly covered, oh yes, 2013 has one very new lecture. Um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> so my recent research over the last two, three years um, has mostly been about compiler correctness. So you know, on day one I said to you, you can use logical relations to prove uh, compiler correctness. In particular, the idea there might be, you can do this in a, in a bunch of different ways. Um, but one um, simple idea that's been around for ages is that you can set up a cross-language logical relation. So let's say you have a source expression that compiles to some target expression. All right? You can set up a logical relation that relates different languages on the two sides. So far we've been setting up logical relations to do equivalence of, of two programs in the same language. But you can set up a logical relation, I call these cross-language logical relations, to relate source programs to target programs. Um, and then you can use that logical relation as your definition of what equivalence between source and target should mean. Right? Compiler correctness says when you run the source thing, you should get the same behavior as when you run the target thing. So you can essentially capture that statement by specifying a logical relation. Um, so my, back to my lecture in, um, in uh, 2013, um, I think it's probably the second last lecture or maybe it's the last one. It's a very long one. I went over time. I, I, I compared two approaches to doing correct compilation of components. Um, and I say components, let's back up a bit. I'm sort of covering what's in my slides, uh, but never mind. Um, okay, so if we talk about ComCert for a second. Um, ComCert for the longest time, do people know what ComCert is? 
Yes. Okay. Comsert is a verified uh, compiler for C uh, that Xavier Leroy and various of, uh, colleagues of his have been working on since uh, um, about 10 years now. Um, and it's really um, an amazing um, project. Uh, the Comsert compiler has actually been subjected to significant random testing, and it has come out to be you know, uh, more robust than GCC and LLVM, which have been in production for decades. Um, Right. Well, LLVM, not quite decades. Uh, but um, there is a paper at PLDI 11 or 12 by um, John Regeer's group at Utah, which says, so far, Comsert is the only compiler, the only you know, sort of um, C compiler, that we have found to not contain any wrong code errors or any miscompilation errors, at least in the verified part of Comsert. At the time, not all of Comsert was verified. I think there was a bug in the parser or something and there may have been a bug at the very, very bottom. Like, the bulk of it was um, verified at that time. And since then, you know, that verification has grown. So it's more robust now. Um, okay, so, um, Comsert proves compiler correctness for whole programs. It says that if you compile a whole program, then you, uh, then I can, you know, my theorem guarantees that when you run the source program, you get the same thing as when you run the target program. Okay? But in true, in reality, we almost never compile whole programs, do we? Even when you think you're compiling a whole program, you're actually compiling something that will be compiled down and linked with something at the target level. You're going to link with the runtime library at the very least. <coughs> you're probably also going to link with various um, other libraries, C, co uh, C libraries and so on. And we write multi-language software these days, right? So you might want to link with code that actually comes from very different languages from C. So my point is that you know, the, the traditional theorem that um, Comsert has proved um, does not handle, or did not handle, there's a caveat, there's recent work, um, basically said that if you compile a whole, sorry, let me change this. If you compile a whole program P to a whole, pro, whole source program to a whole target program, excuse me, uh, then when you run the source program, you're going to get the same observable trace of events as when you run that compiled target program, PT. And basically the way that the proof works is you line things up. You say that there's a simulation between these two um, behaviors, right? Um, if PS and PT are related, then, and I take one step here, then I'm going to, uh, then I can take one or more steps at the target level and things will line up again. That's essentially how the proof goes. But if you think about it for a second, and I'm keeping this very high level, but you know, you can't, if, if the source and target program were components, how do you run a component? You can't run a component, right? You have to talk about the context in which that component will eventually live. You have to talk about what you're going to link it with. And that notion, you know, um, that is called compositional compiler correctness. You want to be able to write down a theorem that says the compilation of a component is correct, not just the compilation of, a, of an entire program. And this is a really active field of research right now. Um, Okay, so that's where logical relations come in. You can, you can actually do this components if you use this cross-language logical relation technique, right? You say that I have a component ES and a, that compiles to a component ET, and logical relations give you this nice structure that you can talk about components and, and stick them into the rest of the context, so to speak. You're all, you've already seen this, right? I talk about um, there. When I talk about the open logical relation, imagine that this is source and this is target. These guys specify what my inputs are. So think about this at the low level and the high level, right? A high level source program has some inputs that it's waiting for. The compiled target program is waiting to be linked with certain things at exactly those same spots, so to speak, all right? And when we say that you get to give me all possible you know, related substitutions, what we're really saying is that if you give me code to link with that, you know, at, um, If you give me something, um, ah, I need to do this more. Okay, so if you compile ES to some ET, and then you want to link with some ET prime, that's the thing that you want to link with. As long as you can show me that there is some ES prime that is logically related to that ET prime, this is what happens when I say give me related substitutions, right? Then I know that when I put this whole program together, I'm going to get the same behavior as when I put that whole program together that those two will be related. That's kind of the idea. 
Okay? That's, that's why I keep saying um, that these cross-language knowledge correlations give you correct compilation of components. All right, so that lecture basically goes into, it does an instance of uh, you know, a really naive compiler transformation, uh, but it shows you a cross-language logical relation for proving it correct. And then I show you the drawback of the cross-language logical relations approach. Basically, the drawback is that if you look at what I just said, you know, I said, all right, I compiled my component ES to my component ET, and now you're going to give me some ET prime to link with. But before I can say anything about whether it's okay to link with that ET prime, I'm, I'm demanding that you also give me some ES prime that is equivalent to it, equivalent using my logical relation. That's a really strong requirement. What that says is that I, the, the, that compiler correctness theorem is only allowing you to link with code that is related to something in your own source language. You can't link with code that might come from uh, maybe other more expressive source languages. Okay? Or at least you don't have a good way of reasoning about that. I mean, what's worse to me is that there's no way to sort of just type check the target component and at least have some, um, you know, sort of, okay, you, you are allowed, you know, the theorem does allow you to link with this kind of thing. The only way you can definitely know that it's okay to link with this arbitrary other target code is if someone also tells you that it, it is in this equivalence relationship with some source code, and that source code has to be in your language. So, as I said, this is an active area of research. So anyway, um, my students and I have been tackling this with call it something called a multi-language semantics technique, um, and that lecture basically does a whole proof using a cross-language relation, shows you the drawbacks of it, and then does a whole proof using a multi-language uh, technique. All right, and I have references to various papers and things in my slides as well that we can go into. So yes, OPLSS um, 13. It's either the last lecture or the second last lecture that is about compositional compiler correctness and how logical relations fit into all that. And by the way, the multi-language um, technique that I'm talking about also uses logical relations, so it's not that it doesn't. Um, all right, should we let's jump into it? Yeah? So feel free to stop me. Um, and I'm going to skip over some of these slides, given how much time I have. Can't do full screen. <laughs> hmm. That's perfect. never happened before. <laughs> of course, now I won't be able to use this. Okay. Um, all right. I guess I'll manage. Uh, all right. Um, okay. Well, this is just uh, what I've been saying to you. I'm making a distinction between unary logical relations and binary logical relations. And, you know, again, I just want to keep you, um, one of the takeaway messages is, you know, the slogan that I've been repeating from the very beginning that uh, I'll logical relation basically says I'm going to take something that has the property and give you back something that has the property, right? Or I'm going to take related inputs and give you back related outputs. Uh, let me just jump ahead to sort of talking about uh, the history. And 
need this. No. Hold on. Good? No. This is so bizarre. Why is it cutting it off? All right. Okay, so um, the earliest instance of logical relations, they weren't called logical relations back then, is something called Tate's method. Um, so this was in 1967. That's how far back this proof technique goes. It's really sort of amazing. Um, it goes back to 67, where Tate used um, what is essentially a logical relation to prove strong normalization of Gödel's um, T. Um, and then Girard used a reducibility candidates method in order to prove um, strong normalization for system F. Um, and that reducibility candidates are essentially a form of logical relations as well. We didn't, um, so, you know, the, when I say reducibility candidates, that has something to do with the rel relation that we were setting up when we were talking about system F, right? I'm talking about Girard, so I'm talking about system F, the second order polymorphic, uh, the second order lambda calculus. Um, <clears throat> and basically, it was this idea of, you know how when we tried to give the interpretation of for all alpha tau, we couldn't stick the tau one or the tau two, we couldn't substitute it in for the type for alpha, and then more importantly, it was that for all relations R that relate values of type tau and tau two. That relation, those, you know, this, this word candidates refer to what are the good relations that I can stick in here, all right? So you will sometimes see this, they will be called admissibility relations or they will be called candidates, um, and they all have to do with what are the properties that you're building into that rel. And you will need richer properties as you um, try to do logical relations for richer languages, right? That's just to sort of give you a hint of the, of the terminology that you might encounter. Um, <coughs> all right, <coughs> so I think, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so I believe it was Plotkin who first coined the term logical relations. And um, I, I wish Bob was here. He isn't. No, okay, <laughs> um, right. So um, there's some question as to why logical relations are called logical relations at all. Uh, one explanation could be that it's because um, if you look at the, the, the type interpretations that we're setting up, right, it's, it's all based on the logical structure of the types. If you examine the definitions that we have written down, the V interpretation, the definitions always decompose on according to the logical um, structure of the type. So for interpretation of tau 1 cross tau 2, the definition refers to the interpretation of tau 1 and the interpretation of tau 2, and so on, right? Um, but I don't think that that's the original reason that Plotkin used it. And there's a nice post somewhere on the types list. If you Google it, you'll find it even now, where um, someone asked this question probably around the early 90s, and uh, Plotkin replied and said, well, I was actually thinking of this. Um, but don't quote me on it, because I don't remember the details. Uh, OK, so um, the two really important papers are right here. Uh, John Reynolds, 83, uh, types abstraction and parametric polymorphism. Um, that really establishes that the second order uh, lambda calculus, or system F, um, has this property called parametricity. Okay, so that's sort of the landmark paper. Um, and then three years later, John Mitchell wrote this paper, which I was telling you about earlier. Um, oh, no, this is not the one. John Mitchell wrote a paper in 85 called, called Abstract Data Types Have Existential Type. Um, but this paper essentially establishes representation independence um, and how that connects to data abstraction, exactly the concept that we were talking about today, right? Um, and representation independence for existential types being a sort of the dual concept and, in fact, a consequence of parametricity from existential types. And then there were lots of uses. Um, there's the Literature is really kind of littered with various uses of logical relations, and sometimes they're not even called that. Um, but I'm going to focus sort of on uh, my neck of the woods in some sense. So around, around 2000, um, here's what I would say were uh, sort of the well-known shortcomings of logical relations. They were used in all of these little papers for theoretical, you know, kind of toy languages. We didn't know how to do logical relations um, for a combination of features that appear in the practical languages that we use today. So in particular, I would want logical relations that can handle uh, not just polymorphism, but also recursive types and also mutable references all at the same time. And that didn't exist, all right? In fact, mutable references that, you know, were really tough. This, this idea of, of what I mentioned before, um, because you can have closures, 
that you can store in the heap. You know, and that led to certain circu semantic circularities that people didn't know how to address. And the other idea was that, wait, this slide is different than, this is OPLSS 13. Excuse me for a second. <laughs> this is what I want to use. <laughs> okay. No. Close that. Open. Tell me about placement. Good. Navigator. All right, I'm here. Okay. I changed the slides a little bit. Um, <laughs> I added a bunch later, so it's, it'll be important. Okay. So, um, mostly they were used for toy languages. And the other thing was that people had mostly, you know, when you talk about a logical relation for simply typed lambda calculus, the world is pretty simple. It's, um, you know, there are no circularities that arise from any weird features and everything is nice and elegant. But as soon as you start to add language, uh, sorry, add features to your language, like even if you just add recursive functions, you have to, if you're sitting in the denotational world, you will interpret, uh, you know, the terms in your language um, and types using um, um, CPOs or something, using some sort of denotational semantics trick to, to, you know, handle the circularities that arise in the presence of those things. Um, so there were mostly people who were working on denotational models, basically come up with some sort of a mathematical representation of, um, you know, a mathematical model for your language. Um, and basically, you know, the kind of math that you use, the categories that you use, et cetera, becomes rather complicated when you add these really sort of difficult new features. And the other thing was that, you know, um, it wasn't really easy how to compose different denotational models. Like if you have a denotational model that is able to handle recursive types and now you want to go in and add mutable references, people, it, it often felt like you kind of have to start from scratch. And this, this pertained to even like uh, models that people were doing using game semantics. Like people uh, had game semantics models at the time which allowed you to reason about um, equivalence for uh, polymorphism. And then there was another model for mutable references. But I remember talking to people and saying, wait, so can't we just put them together? And the answer was, well, it's not obvious at all. And so there was a sort of lack of compositionality with like putting these um, models together. All right, so I mention all of this because then, you know, there were operational models as well. What we've been setting up are logical relations based on operational semantics. And I say that because if you think about the E relation that we set up, when are two terms related at a type? We say, let's just go run them. How do we go run them? We sort of take the operational semantics of the language as ground truth to begin with. And we use it then to specify what we mean by equivalence in our um, logical relation, right? So the operational semantics is almost like the trusted core that you kind of build upon, right, in this setting. Okay, so, um, but of course things weren't that great in the operational world either. Um, so now, at the time, um, what people were starting to do, and let me show you a table. And this table basically covers, um, yeah. Oh, come on. All right. It's 67 to 2009. Why is it? View. Slide only. Hmm? Sorry, say that again? If I just do... Ah, <laughs> no. <laughs> Actually, it is progress. Yes, thank you. Uh, that does help a little bit. Maybe it would help to just change my settings. <laughs> Except it's not going to be fine because I've lost my navigator bar. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in this mode, I can't. <laughs> bad. All right. Okay. Let's let's keep going. Um, all right. So here's a table. Um, at the very top, you see uh, Tate and Girard. Uh, so those 
are unary logical relations. And everything else that I have on this slide are binary logical relations, sort of selectively chosen. Um, so you can see Plotkin, Satman, Reynolds, Mitchell, they're, they're up there. Um, now, the ones that are in blue are actually operational logical relations. Right? They're not step index. The ones that are in red are step index logical relations. So I just want to sort of, sort of show you, you know, the, the work that was happening at the time. So um, Pitts and Stark is a really beautiful and influential paper. Um, it, they were the first ones to study how do we reason about equivalence of programs with state. But they started really small. Their language only had references to integers in it. You couldn't do references to functions or references to references. Um, you couldn't have cycles in the store. Just references to base types, to integers. That's it, right? But even that led to a lot of interesting questions about what programs are equivalent. Um, I have some examples in the slide deck which you can look at on your own later. Uh, all right, um, so, but because they restricted themselves to references to only base types, their model, uh, they kind of got away with something that was, uh, that at least didn't suffer from all of those circularity problems that come up when you have cycles in your store, for example. Okay. Um, and then uh, Pitts extended that to recursive functions. Um, that essentially you can, if you want to read up on that, it's in Benjamin Pierce's ATAPL, um, the Advanced Topics in PL book. Um, Andy Pitts's chapter there um, basically describes how to deal with, how to do a logical relation for a language with recursive fun functions. Uh, and he uses Galois connections to deal with, you know, essentially limits of recursive functions. Um, but recursive types, as I mentioned the other day, at the end of that chapter, were still a completely open problem. How do we add, handle recursive types? Um, and at the same time, Lars Burkadal and Bob Harper, and then later Carl Curry and Bob Harper, started taking some of the techniques from Pitts, some of An Andrew Pitts's denotational work. Uh, there was this idea of minimal invariance, and in particular, um, they adapted that into a syntactic setting and they called it syntactic minimal invariance. So here's the problem. Um, you know, when we set up the interpretation of recursive types, when we naively did it, we basically said full V is, belongs to the interpretation if V belongs to the interpretation of a bigger type, tau with mu alpha, tau for alpha. And I, you know, we immediately stopped. I said, well, this relation is not obviously well founded, right? Now, at a high level, what these guys were doing is they were saying, all right, we're going to set up some relations that may not look obviously well-founded. We'll go off to the side and do a whole separate proof to prove to you that they are going to be inhabited. And they used the syntactic minimal invariance trick in order to do that proof. But this was really hard because, you know, you had to set up your logical relation. It didn't look obviously well-founded. You had to go do a ton of work. You can look at Crary Harper to see how much work. Um, it, to, to establish that your logical relation was not inconsistent, that it was in, you know, not the, just the empty relation. So this is all to sort of um, then go on to the stuff in red, which is the step index logical relations. As I showed you, the step index logical relation it just gives you this one little induction metric that you throw in in your definitions, and now suddenly your definition is obviously well-founded again. Right? This comes with a slight technical uh, drawback that, you know, their steps are there, <laughs> but it saves you a lot of work. I mean, the steps are there, right? We've seen them in our proofs. We have to carefully manipulate them and so on. I have some slides later on how other work that people have done to hide the steps. The ugly part of step indexing, you could say, is the steps, and people have done work to hide the steps. Okay? All right. Uh, but the amazing thing was that um, step index logical relations kept scaling up. You can say unreasonable eff effectiveness of step index logical relations. They kept working for one feature after another, after another, after another, without really changing anything core about the stuff that you were setting up. The ideas that you set up for the recursive types, oh good, now I need to throw in references. Well, I really need to figure out how to handle mutable references. That's a hard one. But I don't need to change anything that was already there, kind of, conceptually speaking. Um, so basically, oh my, my PhD thesis is not on this slide because this is relational models, but uh, my thesis was 04, and uh, that was a, a unary logical relation. Uh, it had impredicative polymorphism recursive types, and the main feature was um, mutable references. So that was the first uh, place to show you know, an actual model with um, where you could store functions in, in the heap. Um, okay, um, Appel and McAllister are the ones who invented step index logical relations. And there's a, um, there's a beautiful story about how, <laughs> and uh, you know, there's a there's a paper which uh, there's a journal paper in which 
Um, Andrew even wrote like the story of how they were sitting on a bus together and came up with the idea. So um, I, I can tell you more about that in a little bit. Maybe I can't actually. <laughs> I'll tell you about it right now. Okay, so at the time, um, the, the, the reason step index logical relations came into being, they were just called step index models at the time. Um, I don't think that Andrew Pell or Dave McAllister really knew that they were really you know, the same idea as, as had existed for years called logical predicates. But at the time, we at Princeton were working on the foundational proof carrying code project. All right? and, and the goal of this project um, that Andrew had set for the project was we are going to do um, proof carrying code, um, but we want to have the smallest possible trusted computing base. That was the slogan. We did everything in the service of smallest possible trusted computing base. So now to make this a little bit more concrete, we were designing a typed assembly language. We wanted to prove the soundness of the typed assembly language without, without increasing the size of our TCB, by you know, basically keeping our TCB to a minimum. Um, at the time, uh, and we were mechanizing things. So at the time we were using 12. So the question was, all right, I have a typed assembly language. I want to prove, I want to mechanically prove the entire type system sound. And this was done because you know, there was another proof carrying code system out there. Uh, George Nekula's uh, Cydia systems had developed something and you know, it became, someone found a bug in one of the low level assembly typing rules. And this was obvious that you know, when you get to the assembly level, you really need verification because there are too many rules, there are too many little assembly instructions and you can't get all the details right if you, know, you say, here are my typing rules that, I use, that my type checker uses, but here on proof I have done a paper. So we wanted mechanized proofs. And now I, nowadays I don't have to sell this to you, but back then this was a big deal. All right, so um, we could do this using 12. So we could encode progress and preservation proofs using 12. But 12 had um, basically a lot of, you know, it had a coverage checker, a schema checker, et cetera. These were the, the pieces of the software that you needed in order to uh, check progress and preservation proofs, in order to make sure that you have full coverage of all of the cases, et cetera. And we didn't want to trust that. So we went back to sort of, you know, um, Foundational proof carrying code went back to first principles and said, all right, how do, we, how do we build a model of the type system? We didn't even fully realize that we were going back to like a denotational kind of thinking, but we weren't going to interpret types as um, math, you know, mathematical objects. Types were not going to be inhabited by mathematical objects. They were going to be um, inhabited by syntactic terms and the operational semantics, basically the instruction set architecture of the machine is what we took as this is going to be part of our TCB and we're going to try our best not to add anything to it. So that's the context. Um, but of course, in that context, we very quickly ran into this issue of, oh, recursive types are hard. How do you do a model of recursive types? Oh, mutable references are hard. How do you do a model of uh, mutable references? Um, and for a while, um, Andrew um, worked on um, basically taking, this Vanathan, I think was the name, um, was a PhD student of John Mitchell's at Stanford who had a model for various things. And, Andrew started formalizing some of it, but it was a lot of work, and you don't want to go there. Um, and then he went to this conference where he sat with Dave McAllister on a bus for a, to go out for the, recur, you know, the, the outing or something, and they came up with this idea of step-index logical relations. Sorry, very long story. <laughs> um, so, and the idea, as you've seen, is really simple, right? Um, it's just this idea of giving yourself a certain budget of steps. Uh, and all you're doing is you don't really have to count every single step that your program takes. We didn't have to count the beta reduction step. We did, I was just sort of trying to make things uniform. The only place where you have to decrement the step index for recursive types is when you do an unfold of a fold, because that's where the circularity lives. There you have to subtract one. Um, in the case of mutable references, um, again, you can leave beta reduction and all the other things that are happening in your language. You don't have to count steps for any of that. You just have to count steps when you read from a reference and when you write to a reference and when you allocate a reference, right? The things that have, the operations that have to do with references, there you have to decrement in order to make sure that um, you're not ending up with a model that's circular. So that's sort of the, the overall history. All right, and this slide is about relational models. Um, ultimately, you know, this um, ESOP 06 paper is about recursive types. It's a uh, binary logical relation for recursive types and polymorphism. Um, and then this was uh, the big paper, uh, Popple 09, which, which showed how you can prove really interesting equivalences of um, modules that um, essentially 
use state in a very interesting way to set up representation in the, uh, you know, invariance, uh, to set up invariance between two different packages, relational invariance. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, okay, so I'm going to skip over uh, this mutable references stuff. You can, there's sort of a high level description of, of what happens. Let me just talk about some of the applications. Um, so I've already mentioned what is on this slide, I think. <laughs> Foundational proof carrying code. The relevant papers are up here if you want to take a look at them. And this is the recommended reading that I was just telling you about that tells you about the history um, of step index logical relations. Um, so just to give you a glimpse of the other things that have been done. If you're interested in any sort of substructural types, linear types or affine types, um, at least linear and affine types as applied to state. So do people know what linear and affine types are? Linear is, you know, you can, it's, they're, they're extremely useful for reasoning about resources. The idea that, you know, I'm going to give you something and you can use it exactly once, that's linearity. A f uh, an affine type would mandate that I'm going to give you something, you can use it at most once. You may not use it at all. With linearity, you're required to use it exactly once. Um, so those sorts of ideas, you know, people have known for a long time are really useful, might be really useful um, for reasoning about resources and state is a resource, memory is a resource. So these papers um, deal with that. Um, okay, so unary step index logical relations were also used for proving soundness of concurrent separation logic. Uh, and this was done as part of uh, the verified software tool chain project at Princeton. Um, and again, I'm just gonna sort of go over these. If you have questions, you can stop me. Um, I've already talked about uh, the Popple 09 paper, which deals with mutable references, and there is a very nice follow-up paper, which I think actually cleans up the ideas that we had in the Popple 09 paper. So uh, the dryer nice um ICFP 10 paper um, does a much cleaner version of what we did in our Popple 09 paper, because we were sort of new to it. And it establishes these ideas of state transition systems, that when you have two different packages and you want to relate them and state is somehow involved, you have some sort of a protocol in mind for how these two packages are going to evolve over time. And I'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, I'm gonna skip over some of these other things. Oh, I'll say one thing. So historically, logical relations were always defined by induction on the structure of types. And around the early 2000s, most people basically would say, oh, but logical relations, you need to have a typed language to do that, right? Once you have step index logical relations, you can build logical relations for untyped languages because you're doing induction on the step. You don't need the types anymore. So that, that was pretty cool and almost utterly unsurprising once you understood what step indexing was doing, right? Um, before the induction was on the types and now the induction's on the steps. So, um, so this was the first untyped uh, step index logical relation in this paper. Um, okay, now compiler correctness. I've already said something about this. This idea of proving compiler correctness for components and using cross-language logical relations to do it. And I, I won't really go over this slide, the references are on the slide, but there's the theorem of interest, right? If you have a comp component little s that compiles to a component little t, then we can set up a cross-language logical relation to show that these two things are related, right? And this is the basis of, uh, has been the basis of compiler correctness work um, where you wanna talk about correctness of compiling components recently. There are drawbacks to these things though. When you set up these lo cross-language logical relations, so both of the papers that I have up there, they set up cross-language logical relations and both of them kind of end with, well, we've done a one-path compiler because we don't know how to do multi-path compilers. There's an issue with transitivity. You set up a, a lo logical relation between a source and an intermediate language and then between an intermediate language and a target language. But what we really want is how does the source language relate to the target language, right? You want to verify the first pass, say, Okay, good, that pass is correct. You wanna verify the second pass, say that pass is correct, but then you want a full theorem to kind of fall out at the end by composing those two together that tells you, oh yes, uh, when I compile S, I don't care through how many passes all the way down to T, I, am, I know that S is going to be equivalent to my T, right? I can ignore the intermediate languages that sit in the middle. So that idea, you know, that's, that's still sort of a question really. Um, so cross-language logical relations, like in the form that we've been talking about, um, we don't know how to prove transitivity for them. Um, and the other problem I already mentioned, right? This cross-language technique doesn't allow you to pr 
link with code that um, was not um, that cannot be written in your source that cannot somehow be represented in your source language. Uh, all right, so um, multi-language correct compilation using this multi-language idea. So this is basically um, the idea that we use is that you have a source language and a target language. Really, what I want to do is say that I if S compiles to T, then I want to link with some ET prime. Remember? Let me do this with a pen. If I have some ES and I compile it to some ET, and then you give me some other component, ET prime, and I want to link with it. Really, the behavior of this combined program should be, morally speaking, the same as if I could take this component that you just gave me and link it with ES. Intuitively, that's what we want. We want to be able to say that somehow, but our compiler correctness theorem can't say that because we don't know what it means to link a source component with a target component. Right? So what we've been doing is setting up multi-language semantics. Set up, take the language S and take the language T and add two things to it, these boundaries, ST and TS, which allow you to embed target code into source code. If I can give you a semantics that is capable of doing that using these boundary constructs, and I have to define the operational semantics for that, then suddenly all I need to do is take the code that you just gave me and said go link with it. Here I can just link ET prime with ET directly, but at this level I can wrap it in my boundary, and now suddenly I can put it into any source context, and now I can state a theorem that says, okay, what compiler correctness should give me is that ES linked with this wrapped ET prime should be the same as ET linked with ET prime. And that's the basis of what we're doing with this multi-language semantics work, right? If you have? So if, if your target is binary? No, I mean, if or I, I write some projects and I have uh, a binary language library in binary representation. No, um, no, no, it does not. Um, okay, so your binary representation, you're going to have to do some sort of you know, mapping to, um, I mean, we're talking machine code, right? So at some point you want to map this to an instruction set architecture, some sort of assembly. I'm, I'm trying to lift it one level up so that I can maybe give you a positive answer. Um, there's been a, um, so it does not work for binary right now. Uh, right now it doesn't even fully work for anything that is not a, you know, I mean, you would need a, the idea right now is just to use type preserving compilers and our typed languages are a typed assembly language. So that's the level at which we're working. Um, so the short answer is no, it does not work for binary yet right. at least. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yep. so this, is this will work for that. If you have a .NET IL, this, this is going to be absolutely fine. Yeah. I mean, not that we've made it work for .NET yet, but the ideas should apply to exactly that kind of a setting. Exactly. As long as, so, so, so far we have figured out how to do this for as, as long as you're doing type preserving compilation. Um, and even there, you know, I mean, we're not incredibly rich in terms of our language yet. Um, our source language, for instance, didn't have references when we did it for this paper. Um, so, but, the ideas are hopefully scaling up. We figured out how to do references now. Um, all right, now, um, I should really stop soon. <laughs> uh, let me kind of go on. Um, <laughs> let me contradict myself in the very next statement. Um, let me jump to where I, I should have said, let me jump to where I should stop. Um, you want quick highlights? Uh, logical relations have been used for proving uh, type systems for differential privacy are actually safe, give you privacy. They've been used to verify concurrent data structures. You can look at these slides uh, later. I'm going to skip over the entire section about hiding steps. Um, let's talk about some open problems. These are really from my perspective. They are open problems I'm interested in. We don't have um, we don't have proofs of parametricity for rich uh, dependently typed languages. Let me say that with a, there's a caveat. Um, we do have proofs of parametricity for uh, the calculus of constructions, for example, at least for the extensional calculus of constructions. Um, but I would be particularly interested in um, parametri proving parametricity for dependent type theories that have mutable state in them. And in particular, I want to do that because I want to be able to design dependent, uh, a dependently typed assembly language so that I can write down rich specifications about assembly code all within the type system. 
but there's this massive sort of problem sitting in the way. We, we don't know how to set up logical relations um, for rich dependent type theories like Hoare type theory. So Hoare type theory is HTT, um, is a really beautiful dependent type theory. It's an extension of um, the calculus of constructions, but basically it allows you to write down very fine-grained, um, well, it, it lets you fully specify what's happening with the state in your computations with pre and post conditions. That's why it's called, it's called Hoare types. It's kind of like Hoare logic concept of pre and post conditions of a computation. Um, and then the other problem that I'm interested in is um, fully abstract compilation or secure compilation. I'll just tell you what this is and then I'll stop. Um, so usually when we prove compiler correctness, when someone loosely says the phrase compiler correctness to you, what they mean is what is at the top of that picture. They mean semantics preserving compilation. And basically um, it says that if you have a source ES that compiles to an ET, then if you run ES and you get some value, roughly speaking, then that's going to be equivalent to what you get when you run ET, when you run the target code, right? And here I'm just, the picture says values, but really it's about when you run ES, you get the same observable trace as when you run ET. Okay. Um, what equivalence preserving compilation is about is something far richer. Um, it says that if you have two different components in your source language, ES1 and ES2, and you know that ES1 is contextually equivalent to ES2, okay? Think about the two packages that we proved are equivalent today, right? And, um, if you have two things that are contextually equivalent in your source and you compile both of them down to ET1 and ET2, I wanna be able to prove that the target components are contextually equivalent in the target language. This is a really hard property to prove because your target language, normally your source languages, you know, like your source language might not allow you to do jumps, <laughs> right? Um, it, if, like some, any sort of control sort of behavior. Uh, but at the assembly language level, you can jump all over the place, right? You have control, you have first class control. So how, so you can, the expressive power of our target languages is far greater than the expressive power. Expressive meaning, you know, I can do things to sort of tell the difference between two components much more easily at the target level than I can at the source level, okay? So why do we, why might we want to, to for our compilers to have this really rich property that all equivalences should be preserved? You might say, well, you only ever compile one program. What is this two program thing? Well, remember back to lecture one, there are certain properties, certain security properties, like non-interference, that we can't even express by just talking about one run of the program. We just can't talk about them. We have to talk about them by talking about two runs of the program. So when I'm saying that I want relatedness at the source to be preserved after compilation, I want that relatedness to be preserved at the target, what I'm really saying is I want my compiler to be sort of security preserving non-interference preserving if you have a security type language, right? Or just sort of all of these abstract data types that we have, right? Two different packages, my client can't tell the difference. Well, after you compile, it would be really nice if the clients at the target level can't tell the difference. And here really the concern is, what if my clients at the target level were uh, written in the target language, which does, maybe doesn't have existential types, or were compiled from a very different language? they might have far greater expressive power. They might be able to tell the difference between um, the compiled code in a way that there is no source code in the source language that would ever be able to distinguish those two things. Right? So it's a security problem. It's really about secure compilation. Um, and I'll skip. there's been some work on this. We've done, uh, you know, you can prove closure conversion is, is secure. You can prove CPS translation for a really simple language is secure. Um, and here, this is our most recent result. We, we've proved for a very simple idealized sort of language in which you can do information flow security that you can, you can do non, how to do non-interference preserving compilation, All right? But this is a really rich and really important um, area and there are a whole bunch of people working on it. So um, for instance, um, I should stop. <laughs> um, for instance, um, I'll refer you to two papers. There's a paper on uh, fully abstract compilation to JavaScript where they took uh, simply typed lambda calculus with references um, and they uh, show how to do fully abstract compilation down to JavaScript. And this is important because JavaScript is the assembly of the web really, right? That's where linking happens. If you want certain security properties of your language, you're compiling it down to JavaScript and then linking with other JavaScript code, you would like to prove that your compiler is equivalence preserving or fully abstract 
in order to make sure that security properties aren't being violated. Um, and, um, and there's another group um, in Belgium at Leuven. Um, they've been working on how do we do secure compilation and use um, sort of new hardware tricks, something like protected memory architectures, um, in order to enforce security instead of using um, a lot of the work that we've been doing. We, we use types at the target level to enforce security properties. They've been using hardware techniques and dynamic checks. All right, I'm going to stop there. You guys can look at the slide deck. Sorry for going over. Um, thanks so much. Thank you.